Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The news is flying so fast and furious in this business that sometimes you've got to sit down and talk it out with your friends. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once again. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast where we sit down with a wide ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brains about all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, if you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, please don't hesitate to do so either over at Apple, over at Spotify, or you can find everything archived on our YouTube channel. We'd love it if you could follow us on social media as well, either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. And finally, and probably most importantly, please visit us over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest news, movie reviews from festivals and films from all across the land. On today's episode, we, uh, we actually have a bit of a topic, a bit of a panel discussion, as it were, because as I'm sure many of you have heard, a lot of the recent news about uh, HBO Max and Warner in the States uh, launching their entire theatrical um, selection for 2021 on the HBO Max streaming service for its initial first 30-day run. Uh, While it doesn't necessarily apply to us up here in Canada, because for all those Warner films, we will be getting a standard theatrical release once theaters are sort of back up and running for the most part, it does bring up a lot of questions just in terms of how the industry has evolved in this past year, especially with COVID and how things are changing, not necessarily for better or for worse, but they're changing. Uh, And we ask the... uh, well, it's a bit of an inside joke, but we ask the uh, the question, is the, is the theatrical experience dead? Uh, and while we tend to believe it's hyperbole, uh, there is some arguments, not necessarily that it's dead, but that it's going to be changing quite a bit. And we can make some predictions, but we don't necessarily know how it's all going to flesh out and just really comment. We, we, we really talk about how uh how a lot's going to be changing for the theatrical experience for festival experience for for so much more and because we sat down with uh with friends of the show and friends of the site mr eric marchin who is the host of cinema scene on rogers cable as well as the untitled movie podcasts uh which i do recommend you go check out and plus we talked with christian uh burgess from the toronto after dark film festival to get some insight on sort of the festival side of things and how we we always have to be sort of moving and sifting through this mass of content that is out there and and really getting thrown at us at a mile a minute and it's it's a fascinating time in the industry and it was a a fun talk with two close friends and uh hope you enjoy well anyway boys thanks for coming on as always and as, as, as as you said before uh, we like that we're all people who like to talk and mm-hmm. past few days there's been some pretty interesting news that's come out of our industry just in terms of with uh, the announcement from Warner Brothers about how they are pushing their entire theatrical release to HBO Max in the States for their 30 day window before the usual rollouts yada 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 and now of course today we learn of the potential pushback on that and just so many moving parts to this but uh let me just start with you, Eric, just in terms of how this business is evolving. And I mean, this is a loaded question that we've talked about before, but is this the death of theatrical? Well, shoot, Dave, I thought this was a podcast on the release of Brahms the Boy 2 on Amazon Prime. Um, I think uh, I'm a little <laughs> ill-qualified <laughs> to, to talk about this. No, no, I mean, like, it's interesting because the, the last three days I've been doing multiple podcasts talking about this and it's interesting to kind of, you know, get different opinions on it. Is this the death of the, you know, theatrical release? Is it going to modify it in the future? Um, 
one podcast that I did and uh, my co-host uh, Matt Rohrbeck of the Untitled Movie Podcast brought up a really interesting point that it might not necessarily be the death of cinema, but you might see a comeback for something like the Roadshow uh, edition yeah. of movies where, you know, the big tentpole releases or the films that are driven by, you know, the quote unquote, a tour filmmakers kind of get the more traditional rollout where the window for the theatrical release is much smaller because this year alone, even before this, you know, HBO Max announcement, we were hearing things with, you know, AMC signing a deal with Universal for a shorter window with their releases when, you know, theaters would be able to open. We even saw, it, you know, with Cineplex actually, you know, playing Netflix releases, which, you know, that's when hell freezes over basically <laughs> and, and entirely. And like, that is something that has never happened before. And especially when, like, you think of, you know, the festival season in a regular year that, you know, all the movies that are, you know, Netflix releases releases play at the light box or theaters that aren't owned by Cineplex because Cineplex refuses to play anything, you know, by Netflix. So it's, it's, it's really interesting that those kind of things are, are changing. Um, but I don't know if it's necessarily the death, but it is a change. And I do think that it is a permanent change. I don't think it's just going to be, okay, 2021 is going to be more of 2020, but I think, you know, once we get past the pandemic, whenever that is, I think the model of the release changes. And, you know, there's been tons of people chiming in from Steven Soderbergh talking about like, you know, not every film is the same in terms of marketing or, mm. you know, how you release it or, you know, the idea that when you're releasing a film, you have to think like, okay, how is this, is this going to make the money back, especially when it's a bigger film like Wonder Woman 1984, or if it's something that is supposedly like, you know, Dune or, you know, having another company fight with Warner Brothers like Legendary. So there's, there's so many things to speculate right now, but it is a turning point. And, and I think like, you know, we saw it with Trolls back in April now we're seeing it a little bit with Disney when they were kind of releasing, you know, um, Mulan on premium VOD on Disney Plus and Soul in uh, December on regular Disney Plus and now coming up to, um, you know, HBO Max and Warner Brothers just dumping their entire 2021 slate. Uh, only in the U.S., by the way, we should uh, yes. preface yeah, this. It's, yeah, it tech, yes, HBO Max does only exist in the States for anybody listening in Canada or elsewhere. The rest of us will get the traditional release rollout as theaters open and whatnot, but this is exclusively for the states, for the HBO Max service, for that initial 30-day window. Yeah, and I'll, I'll stop talking now and uh, let Christian actually, you know, get his commentary in there because I just kind of ramble on, so I apologize. Okay. No, I but we all ramble, I think. I, I ramble too, so that's okay. Um I think it's uh, like Dave and I always joke about how theatrical is dead. We always talk about that a lot. And I think it's, I think it's overblown. I don't think, I don't think the theatrical is dead. Uh, I've used um, sort of a comparison to, you know, theatrical has been around for, you know, well over a hundred years and, you know, it's, it's gone through world wars, a, dep a couple of depression, you know, the invention yeah, of a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, it's gone through so much in over a century and this is just another obstacle in the way. Um, we're dealing with a, a pandemic that we haven't seen before. And it's just, it's just another, you know, wrench in the, in the cog wheel and, you know, it's something will come out of it. What that is, it's the unknown. And that's what's fueling everyone's anxiety right now. And everyone's panicking and everyone's wondering, you know, is theatrical dead? I have friends of mine who are like, well, movies are done. We're going to sit on our basement all the time with their 70 inch TV. I'm like, well, some people will do that. Some people won't, or some people will do both like us. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't necessarily agree that theatrical is dead, whatever that really means, but it, it's, it's been changing for years, you yeah. know, it's, and it's still going to change. I find it interesting because it is a business. Like I, I do feel for the, the, the exhibitors like Cineplex and, you know, in the States because they rely on product that they don't have, like they, they, they don't make the movies, they just show them. And then the, and then the flip side is that the studios I was reading an article yesterday, like the Warner Brothers, like they're in the they're in the theatrical business. They spend a shit ton of money on movies and market these films for a big audience. Their audience isn't the streaming audience. 
So, you know, like that's going to change perhaps maybe the size of the movies, like these big summer tent poles, maybe that'll change. I don't know. We'll find out. But uh, there's a big question mark. I like to call it. That's how about do, my how ramble. How do you think all this sort of affects the festival space? Because I mean, for you working as a festival, Chris, at a, at a festival, mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be more and more of a push to get those movies out to a to a situation where they can get monetized as opposed to doing sort of the traditional festival run, which for this year turned almost entirely virtual. Mm -hmm. And with the inevitable closing of some screens, with the inevitable repurposing of spaces, how do you think all these changes are going to affect the festival space? Because I mean, the big the big boys are going to be fine. That's going to mm -hmm. that's a different beast yeah. unto itself. It's the mid to smaller festivals who are really going to start seeing sort of the changes that are really coming down the pipe soon? Um, like, obviously, Toronto After Dark this year, we, we postponed it to next year. Whether or not that next year could happen, I don't, I don't know. It's a big question mark because we're going to have a spill off from 20, 2020 into 2021. Um, I think it depends on the festival and what, what kind of movies you show. And, um, you know, maybe it'll be a mix of like a hybrid and a digital version to each his own i can't really comment because we haven't tried anything this year we just put it off but like i do agree that the big boys will be fine um but there will be this sort of inkling to put on something that sort of helps your audience you know because you you know i can talk, talk about my, our audience like the toronto after dark audience they want a genre film you know a bunch of horror movies and action films and things like that there isn't there's never going to be a shortage of product but it's you know that's never going to change i don't think but it's sort of what how that sort of gets shown to the audience as well as maybe a virtual festival which is something i'm trying to get uh, trying to explore now for next year um because maybe that's something that will work because i've seen uh, blood in the snows tried it this year as well as uh fantasia and other festivals and it's been an interesting read of the feedback of the you know the, the pros and cons because you won't get every film because you might have a lineup of films you might be looking at, but these films won't touch virtual for obvious reasons. So. And I mean, it brings up so many different sort of aspects as well, because depending on how you go to sort of the different spaces, there's broadcast rights, there's mm -hmm. VOD, like there are so many different rights in play. And I'm like, and I don't know if you've been feeling this, Eric, but just especially in terms of, release schedules and just sort of how everything kind of used to operate in terms of having a plottable track of certain movies and how things would come everything these days just seems to be going like blah like it really does seem to sort of be happening and like almost being barfed out into the system and without any sort of rhyme or reason at this stage yeah and usually like with some releases the week of and, and it's interesting going back to you know with like thinking about festivals and and how they'll kind of continue on you know maybe doing a, a combination of of digital and you know in person for for local or you know drive-ins depending on the weather and, and the time of year um but piracy is another thing which is is you know a, a topic of conversation especially with what hbo max is doing now and if you know the releases are only going to you know pertain to um you know, you at the U S specifically, I wonder how that's going to work for the rest of the world. And, and I mean, we're, you know, in Canada, so, you know, the, the crave has already said that they're not going to be releasing anything on their streaming service, which is, you know, they usually work with HBO max and do release some of their stuff like charm city Kings and the upcoming Soderbergh movie. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing as well, but just in terms of looking at like, you know, like, a film critic sort of schedule and, 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 you know, in the before times there was the, okay, this is the big movie that's coming out this month. And, you know, the studios will kind of send you an update every week, every few days, depending on, you know, what studio it is to let you know, okay, this is what we have and this is what's coming out, or this is what we've just picked up from a smaller company. And this is going to release a couple weeks later here in, in, uh, you know, Toronto, and then it'll, you know, be a platform release that'll eventually make its way out to, you know, the suburbs and, you know, further East, further West of, of the city. 
now it's kind of, as you mentioned, a bit of a free for all kind of a bit of a pie in the sky kind of thing where like, you know, you're getting virtual releases to qualify, especially this time of year for awards consideration, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the film is getting a quote unquote theatrical or premium VOD or VOD release. So like something like Nomadland is getting a release now in the U S in LA in New York for awards consideration, but it won't be coming out here um again you know whatever that means in, in, in until the end of january into the beginning of february and there's no release date and going back to the hbo max thing we were supposed to get robert zemeckis's the witches um theatrically That's and then right. that date yeah, kept were. on moving because it was supposed to be you know like the end of october it was going to be released on hbo max that was determined but it was supposed to be released theatrically here you know cases of covid rose so theaters shut down and then warner brothers kept delaying it and then the week of its release which was mid-november they just pulled it completely indefinitely and and nothing has happened since then so you know and 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 at this moment wonder woman 1984 is another one where it doesn't have any sort of um solid footing when it comes to a release in Canada. So I feel like a lot of people will end up pirating, you know, Wonder Woman on, on Christmas day and seeing like the bootleg version. And, you know, like, I feel like this hasn't been completely worked out yet. And, you know, Warner brothers almost kind of, you know, jump the gun a little bit in, in terms of them wanting to, you know, just stockpile their releases on a, you know, a monthly basis. And, you know, like it, it'll be interesting to see how that relationship changes with someone like Christopher Nolan, who is so, you know, adamant with, you know, I, you have to see my movies in the theaters and, you know, Warner brothers used to kind of be uh, a filmmaker friendly uh, studio, but I feel like the studio that's going to be making a comeback in the next couple of years is MGM because MGM has been kind of remarketing itself as um, the auteur uh, sort of, you know, studio because they have the new Paul Thomas Anderson movie, which um, is in post-production. They picked up uh, the next Ridley Scott film. And it seems like a lot of those guys that are kind of iffy on going, you know, streaming will go over to that studio specifically but again, it, the model is changing. the 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 way that we consume things as of now, it's all digital. And 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 as much as I would love to go back to the theater, I'm not going to risk my life for anything. You know, when when the vaccine has been properly distributed and people have been inoculated, like then yeah, I would I would definitely decide. Okay, like I want to go back. But at this moment, it's like I'm okay with watching, of you course, know, some of these yeah. releases at home. And I mean, it does. I mean, I'm I'm glad you brought up piracy as well because, I mean, on one end, it's it, like in this business, it's always been an issue, no matter what. Like you can go back to sort of any sort of example that you want. There is always going to be sort of that element of piracy. But as the subscription model grew and has kind of shown, if something's the right price, people will probably pay for it because nine times out of 10, it's easier to just pay for it than it is to sort of pirate it, especially if you're not someone who is sort of tech savvy and knows how to torrent or do any things like that. And I'm curious, like, especially from your perspective, Christian, because it's one of those things where a lot of festival, like a lot of films did avoid digital because of piracy, because they only have a life if they get out there to be seen either by a subscription service or by VOD or whatever, like, how do you think sort of this embracing on one end, but fear of on the other end of digital is kind of sort of impacting our business right now? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, you know, like we all come from the VHS days. So it's, it's a yeah. completely different model now where there's more product than ever before. And yet now you have sort of the absence of the video store days. So, everything gets to digital or VOD, but unless you have a gigantic sort of marketing campaign and dollars to support that release, it just gets buried in, this, in, the, in, the, in the massive lineup. You just end up the skew. And whether or not you get seen or you get coverage from a, a critic or, or an outlet or something like that, that helps. Um, but I don't know, it's, it's, it's definitely changing in the way just like the constant, I don't know, it, it's such a, a lot of noise because there's so much product out there. Yeah. That's the problem. And how do you filter out the noise? You know, like I, I look at 
I, you know, my daily ingestion of news and product as it is, but, you know, even I can't keep up and I've been doing this for years. And I'm sure you guys are, you know, I, and I talk to Dave all the time. So it's like, I know how much product and dates changing and all this crap being flown at you guys. So we're all in the same sort of boat of no, in, you know, in a sea of noise, but how do we plot a course? How do we know what to watch? How do we know what's, what to be told to watch? How do we keep track of it all? That's sort of the confusing part. In terms of just piracy, like, as you say, like somebody brought, uh, a friend of mine brought it up the other day with the whole HBO Max thing. They said, oh, well, piracy is going to ruin it again. I'm like, I don't know. It's just piracy has always been an issue. That's never going to go away. Sure, it's a lot easier to pirate than ever before. But with streaming platforms being as cheap as they can, like a, a good example is the Mulan example, because they were charging thirty dollars or something like that on top of the of the fee and, and there was all this outrage about like oh my god i have to pay thirty dollars more but yet i don't know the numbers off the top of my head but i'm 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 pretty sure that it did pretty good pretty well for disney um they were you know relatively happy because it was the first title they did as a premium on their own streaming platform i think the studios are really lucky right now because each pretty much all of them but say sony has their own streaming platform so they can easily take all their product and put it on their own streaming platform. Imagine if this pandemic was 10 years ago, they wouldn't have streaming platforms. Yeah, be, exactly. Yeah. You know, imagine it would, there was no theatrical. There's no, like it would be Netflix. That's it. So, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting time. I don't know if I'm really answering your question very well, but it's, it, again, it's just this confusing question mark of where it's going to go. And, you know, as we get into 2021 and beyond. So do you think the studios might get back into the exhibition business as it were like back in the day when there was the paramount theater or the this theater or the that theater that studios would own i don't want to say chains but maybe sort of specific theaters and key markets where they could push sort of their product and sort of have control over the space to get stuff out into the world well, there, we, there, that, there was that, that uh, old, uh, was it the Paramount law in the States that got changed? Right? Yeah, it got repealed, I think. Yeah, yeah it repealed. So I, I think it now, is that, does that mean that you know, a studio can buy a chain of theaters and put their own product and push their own product for months? And is that how it works now? I'm not 100% on that. But um, yeah, the exhibition, I, in a way, it's sort of the pandemic because we all, we all complain about lousy exhibition. Um, blown speakers, dull 3D, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, as much as the exhibitors have a right to be pissed at the, at the, at the studios for you know, dumping their product on streaming or shortening the windows and things like that, but it, may, it gives them a chance to up their own game because I think they've been too lazy because there is a, so much product, like every, as Eric said earlier, like every weekend, it's like what opens on Friday and that's the big opening weekend. And then it's you know, repeat every week for 52 weeks in a year. And we get more and more product, but it's just the movie go, gets shuffled into a theater and then it's good for place by the new one. That has to change because it's not really a healthy business. It's just, it's just junk food. It's con, con, constant con, con, uh, consummation of, uh, of product. And maybe it's a way to sort of curate it a little bit more, um, focus on the films and also the experience of theatrical that we all, that all three of us love. So. Well, and I love, I mean, that's a good point, especially with curation. I mean, Eric, we've sat in enough theaters and we've sat in enough, you know, shitty theaters. We've sat in some good theaters and we've... We've had many existential crises while watching certain movies. Yes, in we a theater. have. But I mean, I'm kind of curious, how do you think the business moves on? Because I mean, at least when I'm looking at this right now, like, yeah, curation is going to be key, but also is the 24 screen 12 screen 36 screen multiplex even a viable sort of model anymore like could we see spaces be being repurposed spaces being shrunk yeah absolutely i mean let's that's a good point especially considering you know like again, the before times where multiplexes in, you know, the suburbs or, you know, small towns in malls, that kind of thing would have, you know, 12 to 24, you know, the AMCs that are now cineplexes had so many theaters and you're looking at like the release of Tenet, which, you know, 
got this window of opportunity to play theatrically in Canada and parts of the world. And that movie could only take up so many screens, but the theater still had to remain open. So they didn't really have a whole lot of other content to play. So it's kind of like you, you have to kind of streamline you know, what you have, depending on also what the studios are willing to, you know, release and, and depending on, you know, the, what the, what the studio makes, you know, the decision with the exhibitor. And I think that it's, it's an interesting time for the exhibitor and, and to going back to Christian, I think that they have to really step up their game a little bit because, you know, things like proper masking is important to, you know, people that love the immersive communal experience of going to the movie and kind of being completely immersed by what they're watching on screen. And I feel like places like Cineplex, you know, are more focused on sort of spreading the brand so thin that they're invested more in like, you know, restaurants and palladium and things like that and not actually caring about the upkeep of you know their sound system and you know their screens and you know not actually thinking about like okay this is how the movie should look or this is how you know the the, the color should look like those things aren't as important as they as they used to be and it's kind of frustrating when you're watching the movie and like you know you notice it and a lot of people might not or might not even care but it's something that kind of goes towards why you know you fell in love with with going to the movies in general you know not every experience is going to be a festival experience where you know they're going to pay attention to those things and I think you know the exhibitors that are sort of the mainstream you know chains the landmark cinemas and cineplex specifically need to look into making that experience the best as possible and 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 quality over quantity is important when it comes to you know going to the film and 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 having that experience and and again like i think that it, it is also you know we're at this day and age where we're getting so much per week um to kind of look at that a lot of stuff gets lost in the shuffle and you know film critics and uh, journalists can recommend things or champion things but I almost feel that the studio system should give more time for a film to breathe, you know, like the, the box office that first weekend for, you know, a, a major release is life or death, you know, depending on how much longer it'll be in theaters. And if the film, you know, underperforms and it's still a good movie, like, you know, not looking at the finances, it'll have a much shorter shelf life and you know whether or not it gets a physical media release or kind of becomes a cult classic later on there's a lot of good stuff that kind of gets you know sucked into kind of the machine and kind of forgotten about completely and then that's not even including you know the art films and and the smaller theaters and you are seeing you know places or, or you know streamers like netflix buying up these old theaters and refurbishing them like the paris in new york and i almost feel like we're getting to a point where netflix could actually at some point announce their own film festival or or something yeah. like that because it, it's you know they have so much content already to, to kind of you know, parcel out, it just feels like they're getting to that point. Or you could see even something like, you know, Amazon, you know, fitting the bill to help, you know, one of these exhibitors that might be, you know, circling the drain financially right now. So that's going to be uh, very interesting. And also just like, you know, all three of us are physical media collectors, you know, what, what is the future of physical media, you know, is, is, because boot the, the the boutique labels can't take on you know a lot of the the newer releases all the time and and you know Criterion has been working with Amazon and and Netflix to release some stuff but you know if if HBO Max and Warner Brothers decide okay this is working for us we don't have to necessarily release this on physical media you know it will save some money and some time and it'll always quote unquote be there you know for people to to watch or stream whenever they want but it's also kind of like that worrying thing where like even if you you know buy something on itunes you don't permanently own it because it could it could disappear especially you know if you move to a different country or you know you move to a different region there there are different you know rules and you know the distributor depending on if the licensing or the rights go back to another company like it's it's one of those things where i feel like physical media could be sort of you know again even more niche than it already is which it is pretty niche at this point so no, and I mean, it's definitely going sort of the vinyl route. And I mean, I don't necessarily think 
the studios would abandon it entirely because it is still the revenue stream technically it's there none of them are in a position especially now where they can kind of turn down a revenue stream but and that's and but that does really bring up sort of an interesting sort of part just about all of this because especially when it comes down to exhibition and just sort of the need to curation and sort of the need to sort of like you say let things breathe a little bit maybe and sort of maybe create a little bit of variety because I mean I even think of something like After Dark where when they're obviously they're renting the theater but they get to control their ticket pricing and there is sort of a tiered ticket pricing like if you buy more you'll save more that kind of thing it's not necessarily going to be sort of lockstep with the with the exhibitor where you'd be showing the films and I'm kind of curious from your perspective Christian like do you think maybe going forward we're probably going to see more tiered pricing like if someone wants to pay to see Avengers Infinity War in you know 48 scale IMAX this that or the other with you know 7.1 surround sound and all that kind of fun stuff do you think maybe the ticket price would change even more so than it already is to be like okay you can go see this movie but it's going to be 35 bucks yeah I, I could see that happen um because I was thinking you know if you think of just the exhibition landscape if we have say you know less screens um, less chains, less theaters. And, you know, if I say I, I literally live across the street from a movie theater, as you know, from Cineplex, say, you know, Cineplex here closes down and I have to go to Mississauga or Toronto, mm. you know, it's going to cost me more anyway. Um, yeah. It, it's like, it's almost like the same thing with physical media because all the niche guys pick up all this, you know, all these cult movies we love and they put out these super duper Blu-rays and they charge, you know, whatever, you know, even like Criterion. So getting up there with Criterion pricing, but people are still buying it. But I think there's still an audience that will pay money to see Avengers, whatever, in glorious 4D IMAX. And I think they will pay for it because it is an event. It, you know, it's like going to the movies is supposed to be sort of a, an, an event. It's not something to waste time. I don't look at it as something to waste time. It's, it's but it, to each his own. Some people just waste everybody's time going to the movies and ruin it for everybody else but there are people that will pay money, but there is a line because they're also competing with the streamings. Cause you know, it's hard to compete when someone is sitting on their couch. Yeah. To get them off that couch. What is it going to take to get you off the couch? And sometimes that is a challenge, even from somebody who works for a festival, you know, our biggest competitor is not, you know, other movies and things like that. It's just getting a person to a movie theater and movie, you know, I think, I, you and I talked the other day about, I think the average American sees about three movies a year. You guys do that in a, in a morning, you know? So, you know, like I see, you know, the last movie I think I saw was Tenant as well. I think it was Tenant. But, you know, I would say probably most people in Burlington where I live, it's like they probably haven't seen a movie all year. Yeah. So it's whether or not, I'm more concerned of whether movie theater is going to be around because, you know, the product is going to be there to be seen. It's will there be places to watch them at? That's my biggest concern, and that's going to change, I think, because I there's a twelve. The Cineplex across from me is a twelve theater. Whether or not they're going to cut down, it used to be an eight screen, and they expanded it. Maybe it'll go the other way again. I don't know, but uh, but to answer your question, yes, I I could see where the exhibition landscape could be literally just big budget tent pole studio releases, and they will charge accordingly. I could also see it going the other way if 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 the issue of curation goes comes back into play and have you know five dollar tickets for gremlins or for something mm -hmm. or something older a little more unique that could draw somewhat of a crowd because I mean as you know we've all shown and seen if the right old movie is playing in the right place mm -hmm. right. and shown properly it'll get a crowd yeah the, the royal's been great for that. I remember seeing Watership Down with you. It was, it was right, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but I, I don't know. It's it's going to be really interesting because it's and also because of the pandemic. I think we're all in a way we're all being cooped up in our houses for nine months. Maybe as soon as the you know life gets back to normal, whatever that means. Quote unquote, um, yeah. Maybe people will be itching to get out to go to the movies and go to restaurants and getting out. They don't want to be at home anymore. You know, because we are social creatures after all. Or it might be even harder because, I mean, you were talking yeah. about like it's it's difficult already, you know, before the pandemic to, you know, get your ass off the couch and, you know, socialize or go to a movie theater. Like, I feel like some people, 
you know, will kind of still be, you know, set in their ways and, and sort of, you know, existing in this kind of yeah. state of arrested development or, you know, seclusion and quarantine in, in that way as well, where like, it might be hard for people to, you know, muster out the courage and, and anxiety to kind of get into it. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a gamble. Like it's, it's a 50, 50 thing, but I know what you're saying where it's like, you know, you kind of want to get back into it again as soon as, as you can and kind of be like, you know, like I, I miss talking to, you know, you Dave in person. Like that's yeah. something that I just kind of, I, I wish we could do more of. And like, I, I feel like I took that for granted. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, you know, it's true because I mean, it's one of those things how it has taken away a little bit of community, just yeah. everything that's happened, but also, I think eventually it'll turn and make us appreciate it a little bit more because as much as people love, you know, their 70 inch 4Ks and their surround sound and yada, 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 and oh, I can stay home. It's just the same. Eventually people will realize, oh, wait, no, it's not. Because I mean, and even when you think about it in terms of going back to physical media and the golden goose for television is done. Like, you can get Star Trek any six ways from Sunday. You can get Batman six ways from Sunday. There are no mountains to climb in TV in terms of what you have access to. One way or another, you could probably find what you want. Mm -hmm. That's not the case with cinema. There's still a lot of stuff out there on the landscape that just isn't there that you can't experience unless you see it on the big screen. Yeah. But to each his own, it's like... You know, we don't count because we're different people. I, you know, I have neighbors and, and friends who like they don't really they don't go to the movies. It's not their thing. They're happy sitting at home or watching on the TV. It could be you know Avengers, whatever the next one. They don't care. You know, whereas you and I, like, I, it's not my first. You know, if I was going to watch a movie, theatrical is my first choice. Well, yeah, but not. But that doesn't mean it for it. Like, I think what's going to happen is that move. You know, uh, distributors and studios have to look at what they're making and realize perhaps that okay this is for theatrical, this is gonna be for our streaming platform. And, and I don't know about this middle ground perhaps, um, but that's, I could see that changing. They're gonna make movies accordingly. Cause you know, look who owns HBO Max and Warner now, it's AT&T. Yeah. They're gonna be pushing, you know, subscriptions. That's what they're looking at. They're not really in the movie business. They're in the, you know, TV and telecommunications business, that kind of stuff. And, and it'll, be, it'll be on the content providers too, to sort of understand yeah. that Okay, Wonder Woman 1984 was made for that screen. Yes. The Steven Soderbergh movie with Meryl Streep was made for this screen. Right, right. The, you know, Downton Abbey's of the world are somewhere in the middle. As I think, because I think even Soderbergh referenced that in, that in that in the article the other day. But even Downton Abbey did huge theatrically. So it's well, that's just it. Yeah. The audience that went to go to the movie. So it's, that's a good thing. Well, the mid-range movie as well has been, I mean, you're mentioning it, like it's it's been getting smaller and smaller mm -hmm. and, and now it feels like this is going to be, maybe that will be the nail in the coffin for that kind of movie where like, I think I could see like that film that's made between, you know, like 20 million to 40 million kind of completely going over to, uh, you know, the streaming services where, you know, they'll put that extra bit of money into to make something that's kind of for quote unquote grownups. Um, where the tentpole films I think will still survive afterwards, but those kind of mid-range films are already kind of shrinking as it is. Yeah, I, I would I would say add to that, Eric, is that, you know, because I think because of tentpoles and, you know, the glut of, you know, summer and fall product, that this sort of, it's kept like the adult movies away, like the adults, it's basically it's our age and, and kids movies, you know, okay. summer, like, the mid, the you know, the middle ground, like those mid-budget movies, were, were like kind of non-existent now, nowadays. They sort of went away, not dead, but they just went away. But maybe, in a way, like it, it'll maybe research, maybe it'll have a resurgence a little bit because maybe the you know people like you and I will stay away from the movies and the kid, and you know, parents aren't going to drag their kids and spend a hundred bucks in the movies watching Trolls World War, World Tour Two. They're going to stay at home and watch it on premium VOD or something like that. So. Well, you know what, boys? I think that's a good note to end on because we could talk ourselves blue in the face, but the the reality is just with the the landscape as it is right now, none of us know shit. <laughs> yeah, to be continued. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. You know, it's it, that's just the way it is right now. But I just want to say thanks again for coming on, boys. It's been fun. My pleasure. Thanks. Oh, thank you.